The next session, which will be chaired by Zoe Baird, who is the president of the Markle Foundation and a increasingly close partner of Techonomies, is going to look at the issue in the context of services and a global economy. Great to have you on stage, Thank Zoe. You, and um, I just want to say that the, the work that Zoe is beginning to do around this is something that, that I and we very much support. And I'm super eager to hear what happens with this session. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. And David has been a real provocateur on our thinking about this issue. You know, we all um, appreciate, I think, that the central challenge that we face as a country is how to revitalize the economy. Um, and Many of us, probably most of the people in this room, feel that technology offers great promise in contributing to that. But the more difficult challenge is how do we do that in a way that broadly benefits Americans? It includes people who aren't at the top uh, economically or uh, don't have advanced degrees. This is the first economic recovery since World War II in which the 70% of Americans, and note that number, the 70% of Americans who don't have college degrees actually faced a decline in real wages. So the impact of this recovery has been felt very differently. And as you've heard, know yourselves, we really have a jobs and wage crisis that's rather persistent. And a lot of those jobs have been lost to technology. The other factor, of course, um, that frames what we're talking about today is the global growth in GDP. And, and this obviously follows well on the presentation you just heard from James, who's one of the great thinkers on all these issues. But we are today, in America, part of a world where GDP growth is faster outside our own borders, where China, India, and Brazil together are in excess of 20% of global GDP. And so we need to understand how we might expand our economic growth at home in this environment of global GDP growth. Is there a way that we can reverse the pipe, if you will, and instead of exporting jobs through outsourcing, is it possible for us to export services that will create jobs here at home? So we have an amazing panel. I'm not going to speak any longer. The question in front of us is, can we scale our exports, particularly our exports of services? And we will um, lead off with Brad Jensen, who's a professor at Georgetown in the Business School and with the Peterson Institute, and has written a great book on this topic. And he's going to ground us in some reality before we get into our opinions. Brad? Thanks, Zoe. Um, so yeah, I'd like to try to persuade you in the next three minutes that we're missing a, a big opportunity for uh, growth through exports of services, specifically business services. And while I think most people will acknowledge that the U.S. is a service economy, services account for, depending on what you classify as services, between 50 and 80 percent of employment in the United States, when you talk about the service sector, people immediately go to Walmart and McDonald's. So what I'd like to do is focus instead on a group of service activities that I'll call business services. And these are industries that <clears throat> the government statisticians put in the 50s of the North American Industrial Classification System. So this is the information sector, which includes publishing, importantly software publishing, it includes the media industries, it includes telecommunications, internet, a lot of the industries that are focused here today. It includes finance and insurance, it includes professional scientific and technical industries, so think accountants, attorneys, engineers, architects, and it includes administrative support activities. So that may sound like cherry picking, you know, that I'm, that I'm going after a small portion of the United States economy. But that business service sector accounts for 25% of employment in the United States. That's two and a half times the size of the manufacturing sector in terms of employment. In addition, the typical rap on these jobs is that they're crummy jobs, they're low wage jobs. The average wage in the business service sector is 20% higher than the average wage in the manufacturing sector. As James told us a couple minutes ago, the manufacturing sector in terms of employment shrank 20% in the decade prior to the financial crisis. In stark contrast, business services employment expanded almost 30%. Okay, 
just to put a sharp point on it, just to kind of get your head around this, I don't think people walk around with the right picture of the U.S. economy in their head. In this campaign, we heard a lot about the automobile industry, how important it was. So automobile and parts employs about 910,000 people in the United States. Engineering services, NAICS 541330, a really detailed segment. Engineering services, who the hell has heard of that, right? It employs 980,000 people, more people than the entire automobile sector, more than twice the aerospace sector, and at average wages that are higher than both. Okay, so I'd encourage you to broaden your perspective about how you think about the United States economy. These business services are important. In addition, they're tradable. Lots of these activities, more than half of the activity, of the economic activity in this business service sector is tradable. Okay, and, and, the, and the tradable part of business services is, is qualitatively different than either the manufacturing sector or the non-tradable part of business services. Workers in that tradable part are twice as likely to have a college degree and more than twice as likely to have an advanced degree. This is really skill-intensive stuff, and because the U.S. is still a skill-abundant place, we have comparative advantage in these activities. We run a trade surplus, a persistent trade surplus in services exports. Okay, and, that, and that surplus has tripled, I think, over the last 15 years. Okay, so we have comparative advantage in this activity. We have a trade surplus, yet if you look at service businesses, they are far less globally engaged than manufacturing firms. Okay, if you look at the share of output from the tradable business service sector that is exported, it's less than 5%. In contrast, in manufacturing, we export about 20% of our output. Okay, so the global engagement of the service sector is, is, is far too low. We're missing a big opportunity. What's the problem? Well, I think policy impediments are a big part of it. The BRICS that Zoe mentioned where there's a lot of growth, they have significantly higher trade barriers to services by some estimates six, seven times the barriers that the U.S. imposes. So I think that that's where there's a big opportunity to export U.S. services to these fast-growing economies. So just to put, again, a sharp point on it, you know, there's a huge infrastructure boom underway. By some estimates, $40 trillion will be spent over the next two decades, most of that in the BRICS. You know, think about you know, the, the water, sewer, highways, airports, harbors, commercial, residential real estate, going to require an army of architects, engineers, project managers, financiers, insurers, all the kinds of tradable services where U.S. businesses have comparative advantage. This is an enormous opportunity, and I look forward to hearing from Ambassador Sapiro about what's happening. Thank you. Thanks. And one of the things that I would like to underscore in the context of uh, what Brad just talked about is that with the development of technologies from the internet to cloud computing to the kinds of things that many of you are doing, a lot of the jobs to provide these services can be performed in the U.S. and we'll come back to that when we um, talk further, but a lot of the support services as well as the more sophisticated uh, services for these business services that Brad's talking about um, do not need to be performed by armies of Americans moving overseas. So with that, I'm going to turn to our next terrific uh, panelist, um, Ambassador Miriam Sapiro, who's the Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, and in that role is responsible for all our trade negotiations involving uh, technology and, and services. So Miriam. Thank you very much, Zoe. I uh, want to give a, a little bit of context to this discussion and then talk about some of the challenges uh, that we're facing as well as some of the solutions that I, I think uh, make sense here. First, in terms of context, uh, during the previous administration, we were shedding jobs at an alarming rate. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we've been able to now see positive growth in terms of private sector employment. We've even seen another 500,000 jobs added in the manufacturing sector. The unemployment rate is trending down, but it's still unacceptably high. So we have a lot more work to do, but I think it is important to keep in mind that uh, those positive developments. In terms of services, we have, as Brad said, an incredible comparative advantage. Uh, 
Services are about 70% of our GDP and support about three out of four jobs in America today. Services are also a critical component of the global economy. I think of services as the, uh, the gears and the grease in a well-oiled machine. So ICT services, for example, critical. Financial services, banking especially. Uh, energy services, logistics, uh, delivery, transportation. These are all absolutely essential for the growth of a global economy and the kind of, of uh, supply chains that we have seen emerging. Domestically, uh, last year, our services exports exceeded $600 billion. And we do enjoy a surplus of $200 billion. We are the largest services exporter in the world. So I think there is much to be, to be proud of here. At the same time, we all feel that there's more we can do. And so we want to see just how services can become more competitive and expand internationally so that we can meet the goal of doubling all of our exports by the end of 2014, which isn't so far off. Uh, it's a five-year plan. And also creating uh, 2 million additional jobs. So what are some of the challenges that we face? Well, there are trade barriers that are discriminatory. And that's what my team and I try to address by negotiating agreements with foreign countries to lower those barriers. And then, of course, to make sure that they're actually enforced. Otherwise, they're not worth the paper that they're written on. Some of the kinds of, of, of challenges include, for example, uh, countries that are requiring service providers to have a local data center. Uh, and obviously, if we talk about the great potential of cloud computing, that, does, that model does not work if every country or a number of countries are going to require uh, the providers to have servers uh, in, in their jurisdiction. We also um, are working hard to promote the concept of free data flows so that we can transfer information uh, more easily among uh, providers and among customers around the world, uh, notwithstanding, of course, legitimate privacy concerns. But we don't want to see those concerns used as trade barriers. We also uh, face caps in some countries on uh, US films and television shows. And so dealing with those caps we do in, in our trade agreements, if we try to transfer uh, instead US content digitally, as we do often, uh, we then face problems with intellectual property rights protection and enforcement. So these are some of the challenges that we're very much engaged with. And I'll say a few words how. But it's also important to remember when we talk about the services sector, and Zoe and I were talking about this last night, a lot of our domestic component is composed of barbers, waiters, waitresses, uh, dentists. These are all services that are provided domestically that are not the kinds of services necessarily that we can export. So services are the backbone of our economy, but not all of the services are, are the kinds of uh, professions that do readily transport overseas. I think Brad touched on some that do, engineering, architecture, uh, law. And there, we sometimes face discriminatory requirements in terms of licensing or an architecture firm having to set up a local office. Those are the kinds of trade barriers that we can, can try to work. But we do have to recognize the, the nature of the, the domestic services industry and, and how it is somewhat different. Now, when a Canadian uh, crosses a border for a haircut, that does count as a US export, believe it or not. Uh, when foreign students come here to study, that is an export of educational services. In fact, last year, we exported more educational services than we did hard goods industrial machinery. So just to give you a sense of, of context for what we're talking about. Now, I'll just be very brief and say a few words about how we're dealing with the trade challenges. We are negotiating uh, bilaterally, regionally, and multilaterally to deal with these challenges. Bilaterally, three important free trade agreements just came into force in this uh, past year. Uh, first, Korea, which has a $580 billion services market. 
then Colombia, and most recently, last month, Panama entered into force, which, because of the canal and because of the nature of Panamanian industry, also has a very vibrant services uh, economy, as does Colombia. So these countries and our other trade partners can no longer discriminate against US companies. They have to treat them the same as they do their domestic companies in terms of both goods. Uh, uh, for the most part, the tariffs are down to zero, although some t goods have transition periods. And in terms of services, no longer can they discriminate. Regionally, you've hopefully heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a very exciting initiative that we're negotiating with partners that range from Australia to New Zealand to Singapore, Brunei, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia. Uh, recently, Mexico and Canada have now joined as well. And we're seeking very high standards in terms of some of the issues that I mentioned uh, with respect to data flows, with respect to a prohibition on location requirements, and with respect to very strong intellectual property rights protections. We're also in the process of discussing with the European Union the possibility of a free trade agreement. If we make a decision to go forward, uh, that will also be a very high standard agreement that will promote our services economy and, and theirs as well. And finally, on the multilateral front, in Geneva, we're working with like-minded partners on an international services agreement that would be very broad-based and update the now 18-year-old GATS, which is the current services regime that governs our uh, relations with our non-trade partners. So these are very exciting developments. We're also expanding the information technology agreement that deals with goods. But the extent that we can lower tariffs around the world on IT goods, that also helps improve access and then creates more of a demand market for our service providers in terms of uh, the kinds of products that, that we offer. Great. Thank you very much. Our final panelist, and then we'll get into a bit of a discussion in the time we have left, is someone you know well, Mike Capellas, a real leader in the industry, who is the CEO of Compaq, the president of HP, is a real expert on cloud computing. Michael. Well, no, thank you very much. Uh, so first one is, I always kind of like to put this in a frame as sort of what the agenda is. And as we've talked about some of the numbers, uh, well, I think the, the export of service is a critical component. One of the first questions we almost want to ask ourselves is, why in the world do we have a trade deficit to start with? Here's a country with un unbelievable natural resources, a trained workforce. So if I read the numbers, 2011, we had a $560 billion trade deficit of which uh, 350 billion was energy, and we had a $200 billion surplus in services. And so I, why I'm incredibly optimistic right now is that you know, I, I think we have the potential over the next five to 10 years to rethink you know, which technology is gonna be a critical component, actually eliminating the entire trade deficit. Uh, for example, you know, front page of the Wall Street Journal this morning, within the next five to 10 years, we certainly have the technology to do horizontal drilling by taking different kinds of data flows, extracting natural gas, become the largest producer, becoming self-sufficient, and by the application, and I understand there are environmental issues to be addressed. So one is, I do believe that the application of technology isn't the creation of technology, but the, what the U.S. does so well is it thinks about it entirely differently. I no longer know what, what a service is or a product is because the service is embedded in the product. The U.S. way of thinking about things is we, we tend to look and we say there is a market need, we do market analysis. We didn't understand that. We build a physical product, we drive it to its lowest components, and sometimes that becomes commoditized. But what the real value creation is, we then decide what is the customer experience, we wrap services around it, we then be able to do global distribution, and we have this wonderful thing called social networking, which then allows us to get a closed-loop feedback system. Nowhere in the world do people innovate in this method. And so examples that we can all think of, if you think about, you know, everybody owns a smartphone. Well, the device is kind of interesting, but that's not what you buy. You buy the service of delivering iTunes for music with apps to be able to connect to do video conferencing. The value was not in the creation of the product. The value was in the service. And for every iPad, iPod or smartphone of choice you sell, the service component has got to be three or four X. Uh, so, you know, what I would encourage is that the innovation that we can actually do to differentiate is the ability to take services embedded in the product, and if the componentry goes to the lowest cost, the value creation and job creation is the ability to wrap services around them. And there's an extraordinary opportunity. In technology, if you go back, you know, probably forever, 
Um, you have five or six years of research and development followed by an extremely rapid 18-month adoption period. Think about the internet. Seven years in development, 18 months of development. Uh, the middle of the decade uh, with networking. Uh, IP networks, five to seven years in development, 18 months before we had smartphones. So why I'm encouraged is we are in the midst of changing the entire IT delivery business. There is a mixture of products and services of which the US should define the service component. Cloud computing, which is you know this sort of mystical thing, but basically it says you no longer need a physical device. I can put in a, a set of capabilities that allows me to buy IT when I need it, and as I need it, I just finished you know, a project co-chairing for the federal government, 71 companies to determine that could the US actually be a cloud, every component is US led. And by the way, international data flows was the barrier, so we'll go there. Second thing that happens outside of cloud is a lot of talk about big data. What does the US do better than anywhere? We analyze data, we get the data, we attract it. All big data says is that you structured and unstructured data to be able to interpret c consumer behavior. Who else besides the US can interpret consumer behavior in these rapid growing markets? And the final one is, you know, the US develop, really invented application development. We then spend five years shipping it overseas. Guess what? It's happening today. The creation in the US of cloud-based application development tools that allows you to actually write applications through reuse. We will reinvent it again and have the potential. So I, I'm actually incredibly encouraged um, I think we set a national agenda not just to export services, but to say, you know, we should eliminate the trade deficit. We use technology and practical applications, and we change the game of not just product and services, but how do you deliver an end-to-end -end customer service? I don't think anybody can do that. And I, I just am incredibly encouraged. Um, I would say the barriers are not technological. We still lead on every front technologically. I do think we have some real barriers around, you know, uh, how we create the will and, and some very complicated national policy questions. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna to come to the audience for questions in, in a minute or two, so please uh, think about what you might wanna ask. But the uh, one question I'd like to ask this panel is, um, we think of large companies as multinationals, as able to function globally. Um, Hal Varian of Google is one of the people who believes in, in an emerging micro-national that small businesses and medium-sized businesses, which is where most people are employed in this country, actually have the potential to participate in the kind of global trade that you're talking about. And I wonder if, if uh, one of you would like to comment on that. Um, yeah, um, I'd be happy to, Zoe. Uh, we're putting a particular focus on small and medium enterprises as we work very hard to meet the NEI, National Export Initiative, goal of doubling exports that I mentioned earlier. SMEs are the backbone of our economy, uh, but only about 1% currently export. And so whether it's goods or services, we are very focused on making sure that they have the tools uh, that are necessary to compete. And one of the things we've discovered is if we talk to our trading partners around the world, whether they be in the Middle East, Europe, South America, Asia, they find they have a similar situation in that SMEs are also a critical piece of their economy, but they're not necessarily exporting. So with some of our partners, we're starting to set up databases where we can link our SMEs so that they can use the digital technology that they have or they can acquire to try to find new customers. Again, whether it's goods or services. We also make sure they have the financing tools that are necessary for some of the smaller ones, especially to try to expand and compete effectively. Thanks, Brad. You maybe each of you want to comment on this, um, Brad. Yeah. So, so what we see. Uh, so, I've done a lot of work looking at uh, manufacturing exporters, and what we see in goods trade is that it's the biggest firms that do the vast majority of the trading, and this poses a challenge in the service sector because while there are some very large service firms, there is a much greater preponderance of small and medium-sized firms in the service sector than in the manufacturing sector. So getting these firms to be able to clear the hurdle to engage globally is a big challenge. And I think that the types of services that have been talked about at this conference, you know, software as a service that enable companies to reach new consumers, to outsource uh, a lot of their back office processes, 
These are the kinds of things that will allow the small and medium-sized firms to clear those barriers to engage globally. And I think that that's you know, a, an exciting prospect, uh, one that offers a lot of hope that you know, we need to clear some of the policy undergrowth uh, and then kind of link it up with the enabling technology to allow small and medium-sized firms to export. I think at a practical level, the opportunity is greater than it's ever been because what small businesses cannot do is create the infrastructure. And you know, what you have now with some of the development of these cloud infrastructures is I can go out and develop the capacity to have big computing centers on just what I need in the portion and I can, you know, I can buy one slice of pizza instead of having to you know, build an entire pizza oven. Exactly. So the enabling technology is in there and secondarily, uh, those technologies, because of the global reach of social networking, allow you to have a feedback loop. So, so there's actually a shortage of good ideas more than a shortage of infrastructure. This is an extraordinary time for that to be able to do that. Quite frankly, there's more, there is capital available. So if you look at the necessary components, we have the infrastructure, we have it readily available, we have the feedback loops, and we have capital. So it should happen. The other thing I'm encouraged about, I mean, if you look at the hard numbers, is job creation has come from the big companies. And generally, after a company becomes public, it starts job creation. What I continue to be, though, encouraged about is we're starting to see big companies develop some alternate models that make them look small. They'll create a division to attack emerging markets. They'll create a joint venture to integrate a, a, a product. I, so a quick story here. I just came off of two years of developing a, with, between Intel, Cisco, and EMC, a joint venture which started with uh, 16 people and one coffee pot to develop a, 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 cl a cloud-based computing. Uh, as of last week, we're at a billion dollar run rate in less than two years with 1,200 people, almost all engineers, all in the U.S. So it's interesting that even big companies are starting out and say, now let me have a faster, quicker, alternate model. So uh, this is I all enabled by the technology. That is huge. Let's take a question from the audience in the very limited time we have left. Why don't you go ahead? I'm sorry. Oh, did you? Uh, go ahead over here. That's all right. I apologize. They have a system I wasn't aware of. So, Stephen Sprague Wave System, it strikes me that one of the core technologies we under leverage today in the ability to export service and the ability to bypass some of the existing regulatory environments that are out there is the, the real solid application of security, yeah. not for the perspective of, of how do I hide things, but for the perspective of how do I enable content to perceive to be, for example, in France, but is really being stored, for example, in US. Um, the application of how do I manage my, my authentication and my service relationship for confidentiality and integrity is a really important piece of this, yet very much under discussed in this context. And it's probably one of the most powerful weapons that we have in that whole it, sphere of exporting the let, let Mike maybe comment on that briefly, and then maybe we'll be able to fit in yeah. another question. No, they, they, the difficulty with this one is that the incredible difference of opinion, this might be a, almost like last night's political conversation, is it's privacy versus security. I can secure anything if I give you up the right to a certain amount of privacy, and the world has different views of where those boundaries lie, and there is a philosophical underpinning. Technologically, we can secure almost anything if you have, that's point one. So that is a huge issue, just philosophically getting that, and that gap is enormous. So the secondary question is, the mistrust of the US relative to international data flows is when we had this big project about trying to do you know, global clouds is, I had no idea that the Patriot Act would be a huge barrier in the minds of people like the Germans or even the Canadians about why they don't want to do it. So I, this is not a technical question. This is a philosophical question of where to draw the lines. Very difficult issue. Thank you. Um, we have time for another question. I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> why don't you both ask a question quickly? We're almost out of time, but we'll right, try to have right. time to answer it, too. Should I go first? Please. You go right. first, then Andy. All right. Arun Sundarajan, New York University. Um, so uh, I don't have robust data to support my question with that caveat. Um, you know, I personally seem to see a lot of growth in my domestic consumption of services. Um, for services that are locally based, that are not really exportable, you know, accommodation, transport, you know, household. Um, on the other hand, I seem to be a greater importer of services that are importable or exportable, like administrative services, travel services, medical services. Um, 
So beyond cloud computing and software as a service, which I agree are exportable, I mean, where, where do you see the growth coming in the services that are exportable that are actually going to close that um, trade deficit? I mean, like, you know, growing us from $200 billion to, you know, sort of closing that five hundred. Thank you. Million. That's yeah. great. Let Andy, if you ask your question real quickly, Brad, you can take his and... Hi, Andy McAfee, MIT. One of the things we hear from people about why we should be worried about trade deficits, either in services or in manufacturing, is that they're evidence of weakness in our economy, and in particular, evidence of our weakness to innovate. But as I'm hearing you all talk, you're talking about how we're in the lead in almost all the important technologies that are important, either for manufacturing or for services. So could I ask you to comment on if we are running these deficits, is it evidence of weakness? Is it evidence of innovative weakness? And if not, What's it evidence of, and should we be worried about it? Yeah, it's evidence that the United States is a great place to invest. That's why we run a trade deficit, is because the rest of the world wants to invest in the United States. So we export assets. We export treasury bonds. We export, you know, we sell real estate. We export stock. Okay, and in an exchange, the rest of the world sends us stuff. And, and that's the way to think about the trade balance. The trade balance is not an indication of weakness. It can be. It can be an indication that your economy is uncompetitive. But more likely, it's an, it's an indication that there's an imbalance between savings and investment. There are lots of great investment opportunities in this country, yet we're not great savers. So we import savings from the rest of the world by exporting assets. So, so that's how to think about the trade deficit. In terms of the services, we run a surplus in services exports. Uh, services exports are growing rapidly, services imports are growing rapidly, yet the, the trade surplus in services is expanding. So, so I'm not fearful. Yes, we will import low-end services. What I want to see happen is the policy framework so that we can export as many high-end services as we're capable of exporting. It's engineering, it's financial services, it's software. As software as a service, it's lots of design services, it's lots of research and development services, certification services. This whole package of, as Miriam said, the kind of the, the grease that allows the goods economy to work, logistics. So these are all the kinds of things we're really good at. I really want to thank this panel and I thank the audience. We are way over time and David is really mad at me. So thank you very much. I was for... actually going to say you could take one more from Guibert, who's from Argentina. Oh, I thought okay. he might have an interesting point of view. Sorry. Are you going to let you us? You had two okay. economists in a row. I thought a <laughs> practitioner maybe would be interesting because he has a Hello. multi thousand person company in Buenos Aires. Well, yeah. Um, no, I just, I'm Guibert from Globant in Argentina. I would like to just to share my point of view with Zoe particularly because you, you seem to be worried about the export of, of jobs. And I, I agree with Michael uh, in, the, in the surplus. You know, just to, to tell you a short story, this morning I opened up Google Apps, downloaded my email, connected through LinkedIn, uh, checked my, uh, how the sales was doing on Salesforce. Uh, and then check my balance on, on my U.S. Uh, bank that operates down in Argentina. So none of this could have been possible unless uh, we had a job down there. You know, I wouldn't be consuming all this. And at the same time, all the talent that globally we are exporting from Argentina to allow these wonderful companies to create their products wouldn't be that possible. So at one point, <coughs> I'm very optimistic about what we can do, and as a whole, uh, breaking the boundaries, uh, start seeing an emerging market level up, and then start seeing all this innovation <coughs> growing from, from the US. You know, We don't have a Facebook, we don't have a Google down there. Uh, you are importing a lot of entrepreneurs. America is a great country, and I'm very th thankful for, for all these opportunities that are coming. Thank you. It, and I think that it is important to keep in mind that what we're talking about is creating a more vibrant U.S. participation in a global economy. Um, but we need to create a more vibrant U.S. Uh, participation because we have tremendous opportunity, but we're not capitalizing on it adequately and not creating enough jobs at home. Uh, but we can, I think, as you've seen from this panel, we can do a lot here. And I hope that this has been useful to you in your own endeavors too. Thank you. Thanks, David.